All right, hello, people. Is this kind of the weird one in that it's kind of half presentation and half workshop? This is generally just the topic of, yeah, it has the lofty goal of how to implement anything, but essentially it is how to figure things out without relying categorically on tutorials because that's kind of a crutch and being able to figure out how to implement things that people don't have tutorials on. I do this a lot because I make a lot of weird games with weird mechanics and there's no tutorial for that. So you got to figure it out yourself. And along with this, you get sometimes, sometimes even conventional mechanics seem kind of weird. And how do you even do that? This was, this was an example of like, when I was starting out, I had no idea how to do ropes or grappling hooks or anything like that. And it turns out it's actually a lot easier than you think, as we will prove in this exact thing, hopefully. But even then, you get into the weird mechanic space of, I included Baba as you here because you kind of have to. Like, how did they even figure out how to do that? I can think of some ideas, but I, I still have no idea. This is an incredibly innovative system. And make it, like, extendable. Truly, really, the world may never know unless they data mine it. Baba is very complex. So yeah, that's the general starter question is like, if, you, if you're looking for tutorials, this is generally the question that a lot of people have. And yes, I could probably show you how to implement a lot of things, but that's not really the point. The point is giving tools and mindsets to help you all figure it out yourselves. Dividing labor length lives. And this is, I'll be, I'll be frank, this is a good message, but I mostly just wanted to include this meme because it sums up programming perfectly. The, the, the computer needs to figure out how to do a facsimile of the thing that you understand intuitively because there's no intuition in programming. At least on the, on the compiler end, there's no intuition in programming. So this gets into the topic of system design, which sounds scary, but it's a lot of just, I, I actually looked for trying to find formal documentation on like, what are different system design approaches that people use? And it's literally just these. These are the only ones that people ever quoted. Is you got top down and bottom up. Top down is your classic kind of, you've encountered waterfall. This is essentially what it is, is like just go down from first principles and design everything first without ever touching the code and just break it down into systems and those systems and the subsystems and such. And then bottom up, you start with things that actually do hands-on like lower level things and then you combine those in order to get hopefully a holistic system. And I say hopefully because this does not always work. Benefits of top-down is that it actually has that holistic view the entire time. You start with that, and you know where each part kind of fits into that whole thing. Whereas this is very kind of prescriptive, and it doesn't leave room for changing approaches. And ch approaches will change just based off of the tools you're using and based off of this could be implemented technically, but it would take way too long and too much effort, and it's not worth the investment. Well, also, sometimes if you're if you're only looking at a specific system and trying to subdivide it, sometimes that creates redundancy when you look at that thing that you just subdivided versus uh, the other three things that are identically structured, but you didn't notice that because you're focusing on each one individually. Compare this with bottom up, where essentially you start with the things and because you start with the things, you understand what those things can do. And then you can think about how you can reuse those across different parts of the system in order to not repeat your work. And it actually allows you, because you're working on the things that are lower level, it allows you to run into those problems that cause you to iterate earlier. And then that gets embedded into the design process as you go along. But at the same time, you're building things on a low level and you're not really understanding how any of these, these things connect until later. I have a genuinely real example of this happening just from this semester. I was prototyping the game I'm making for my capstone and 
I, I was making a dialogue system that needed some file input, but I made the dialogue handler before making the file input. So essentially ended up for a while being this awkward dialogue file handling hybrid controller class, which was kind of terrible and janky and very long until I had to take all that file handling functionality and break it out into its own object, which took a little bit of doing, but it did, it did happen. And that's the kind of thing that can happen with this approach specifically, is that even if you're trying to think about it, sometimes you end up with a weird placement of responsibilities where things don't necessarily need to go, but that's vestigial from like, we just need one object that does all of these basic things so we can get a sense of what we're doing right now. So generally the suggestion is to hybridize these, take the benefits of one, and combine them with the benefits of the other. Yet the kind of rough in the architecture without actually prescribing much, while also thinking of reuse possibilities and not just locking down a, a specific solution or way of implementing things too early on. That way you can go back in once you encounter problems and revise it or you design the individual components first while also trying to maintain that model of I'm designing this thing right now, but I know what this thing needs to do in the larger system, and here are the five things that it needs to connect to, just kind of in the back of your head. So this is the workshop portion, is that we're essentially building grapple hook, essentially the Titanfall version with like the old momentum slingshotting thing you can do, but in Godot. This is the in-progress version. Hopefully it goes better, but... This is the kind of interactive portion where we go over like the kind of design process behind it. So yes. primary questions for that base architecture are we know we know what a grapple hook is and what it does. Small bit of context here. This specific kind has a mechanic where it doesn't just pull you toward it. Once it anchors, it actually um It bases it off of both the direction to the actual anchor point as well as the way that you're looking in first person. So you can kind of like steer yourself away from that point, which is how you get kind of the, notice that we never impact the cube in this GIF. So like we aim away and then that causes us to move a little bit away towards that look direction while also keeping the momentum. And then it essentially just once it hits a certain angle between those two look directions, then it'll just automatically cut off the grapple for a nice little like, oh, I'm like kind of swooshing the rope behind me and like launching off from that kind of thing. So generally, ideas on how we can model this in a game engine. I have the exposed chalkboard for a reason. Ideas? Um. That latter one. When we say model, it's essentially a way of representing the problem that the computer can understand because the computer is a dumb pile of rocks. Mm -hmm. to factor that in where you might be. Okay. So we have two positions. We have position where we are. I guess it would be more of my position that we're looking at. Uh, what else for a grapple hook? We probably want to consider the mechanics of how to actually push the character in that direction, although I don't know how we're going to treat I'm just trying to list things we need to consider when we implement it. And we'll have to consider the 
players position sort of dynamically as they move through the air. Yeah. Um, right, so we got player position. One thing that I have not heard mentioned is we we actually need to know where we grappled onto in order to actually move there. So that's that's a portion of it as well as uh, how do we know where we grappled onto? We just save the point. Okay. Or we can save the point, but how do we know what the point is? So what what do you mean by the object thingy? Um, you don't have those objects at that point. I guess you don't want to grab one to like pick it. Yeah. So like collision testing. Like, so collision testing on that point there. I know, I know you mentioned Raycast. There is a version of this system that uses the Raycast. Is not what I ended up settling on, but we could totally do it. That's actually what what I was doing with that earlier. Yeah. Are we considering the point of travel as a relative to the actual object? Like, if you have a point that gets stuck onto you, say, let's say this is the object, and its model sort of has like this sort of fixed, um, like it has it has a fixed it has it, it's been three D modeled right as a fixed. Um, I don't worry this very well. But if you grapple onto a specific part of that model, are we sort of always saving the point that part of the model is always at? So if the model is I figure if you account for that, you, you can also account for moving objects, but I might see where it's like um, having an actual not just a static position for where we grappled onto, but also like a tracker. So that it yeah, can track with like if you like what like a position for the object. Yeah, sort of like that. Like not a building. Yeah. I was if you grapple onto a giraffe, you want to make sure that like you grapple onto its neck and if it moves, you're still following where it's going. Okay. Yeah, I think it's probably if you because the way I was thinking about it is like if you could like grapple onto a point. And you save like the exact like X Y Z coordinates that point that you grapple onto. You just have the player get pulled towards it, but then you run into the issue of like if stuff is moving around, yeah. you are just going to fly to a point. Like if there's something flying through the air and you grapple onto it, and a thing keeps flying, at that point you grab onto stays yeah. in place. You're going to fly to a spot. Yeah, like a you would have to implement it in a game where there's really no object that you can grab one to moves ever, which might be limited. There are a lot of ways to do things. This this goes back to the, the like if there's one way to solve a problem, there are twelve ways to solve it. So I guess next question is. If we have generally game engines tend to run on objects, so like what things are objects and what does every object do out of this kind of list that we've generated here? The player object, like what that player object will do is have a force applied to it in the direction of that target point. And the target object? Yeah. Okay. Those two? Anything else? Yeah, I don't know if the grapple would like around the whole thing. Does the grapple like glide thing actually collide? For the sake of like not getting into like stroke physics, there's there's no physics here. There's not. I don't know. Do you think I had time to make rope physics in like one day plus change when I was making this project? <laughs> Even I have limits. I think the force that the player object is in the direction of the um, target point, I think it's also going to have some sort of force that can take action on it based on like the camera direction or any keys pressed. But I guess it just goes. I feel like this would be easier to like. 
create a prototype of the most basic version. We just start off by grappling to the other and just create down the force pushing you straight there and sort of add components to it later. Yeah, so like that's that's kind of the iterative approach we described previously. And that's actually a really great suggestion for like just get something working and then expand on it. That's actually a really nice strategy that, that's helped me a lot. So moving on from that, we have components. I, I'm trying to think of anything that would actually be reusable, but sometimes this is a lot more helpful for complicated systems. Could be. Yeah, this, this, this could also be used for a lot of things either. Oh yeah, if like if like the wind in a certain region is causing all objects to have another force in some other direction. You're officially implementing what the golf for the grappling hook. <laughs> we're, we're, we'll get there. Yeah, no, oh yeah, this this is generally a bit more useful for things like um i know in the other example i had suggested for this one like space thrusters i thought about like well you can reuse a lot of this because you can just make one single type of object that is a single thruster and it has like a function you can call to activate or deactivate and then you could just plaster those all around your model and have a list of them and then just like go through the list and activate or deactivate based off of things and then you wouldn't even have to go through and manually toggle visual effects because the individual object has solved that problem for you which is where the reusable things come in handy but this one doesn't really have those oh god it's that one yeah this was a slide that i added after working on the actual project which is the fact that sometimes your engine does not align with what you think it's going to do this is this is the small tirade about the fact that Godot does not actually allow for on-demand raycasting. It has an object that does a raycast, and you can request a raycast from it. But in order to actually swap around the way that it's facing, you have to like update that and then either wait for the next physics loop or call a force update and then actually request a raycast from it. So it is it is it would probably be less jank if I wasn't used to the way that Unity does it with on-demand raycasting and such. But sometimes that throws you off. As well as if we just go go in to the actual project that I have prepped here. Is this the right script? Yes, this is the right script. So essentially, this is the... Can't see anything over there. Why must the wall have a... Well, we can see it better now. Got the, uh, got the basic structure. Ignore this label. This was literally just debugging. It's still in there, but where? We essentially have things that matter for this are the player object, which technically has, it doesn't have physics applied to it because I tried implementing this with Godot's physics system, and we are still mortal enemies. I did not mm -hmm. figure out any of that in the day plus change that I had to work on this, so I had to write all the physics myself. But we have essentially, I had to, I had to do some background work on making the making the basis for this. So, like, if you want to have a first person grappling hook, you need to have a first person to begin with. So, there's some of this that's related to the implementation of the actual first person free look movement. So that's where you get this kind of camera mount object, which basically just gets the look direction and points itself in that direction. So anything that you child to it automatically inherits that. This is why we can just have this raycast. This is the raycast that actually was used for the original raycast version of the grapple hook. You can see it extending out here to however long we want the grapple range to be. And that's the way that it was implemented when it was using Raycast, but it's not now. Now it's on a projectile system. 
but you could just as easily do it with Raycast. And it might actually be more consistent doing it with Raycast because that would be more of a hit scan type of thing. So you don't have to wait for the projectile to go out in order to grab one with things. If you're in a tight spot, you might want that hit scan better. Yeah. Yeah, that threw me when I first had to adjust to it. But yeah, it's those kinds of considerations that you get more used to once you've used an engine more and adjusted to kind of its crap factor. <laughs> Every engine has its own kind of crap factor. It's just a matter of adjustment. And then more specifics. This is, this is an interesting one because then you get into the kind of, who is it that makes the decisions here? Because sometimes that's not entirely clear. Because if you have the player making all the decisions, then you have the player intentionally requesting a position from whatever thing that you're using to track the grapple hook status in order to actually request whether there has been a collision in the player object, which seems kind of weird. Which if it, it makes sense more if you're doing this in a projectile, you would have the projectile as an object actually track that collision rather than just like if the projectile slides or something then you do. Yeah. It's essentially the whole role of this grappling hook projectile is to go out, hit something, detect if it hits something, and then communicate back to the player that something has happened. Normally you would use events for that, but uh, Godot is real funny about using events because it only lets you hook up signals between things that are in the same scene. So if you have a scene for prefabbing in like the actual projectile part of it, you can't connect that to the player because it doesn't register the player as having existed yet. Yeah. As well as the fact that a lot of engines are more consistent than you would think in terms of like what they offer in functionality. Sometimes you get weirdness like, you know, having recast be objects. But usually, these are all things that you can do and have access to. I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole list. There is this list and a whole lot more. But this is kind of just a hammer in this thinking of like larger system thinking rather than how do I actually do it in code kind of thinking that can be helpful for these kinds of problems. Just... Uh, Is these were the three main ones that I identified. Sometimes they call them different things, but essentially every game engine in existence needs to be able to do these things in order to call itself a game engine. And you can always fall back on these if you have some weird feature you're trying to use and none of the custom stuff actually fits with it. You can always just do it the kind of low level way. Yeah, I was like like raycasting was one of those things where I didn't think I didn't really know about it until I started like going like doing game development because it's like well, almost everything I've been doing like in the physical world is using raycasting in some way. Like you're always checking you I feel like I'm always checking something with raycasting. Whether that's like locking onto something or like seeing where I want to go next or something. Or can you see a thing? Yeah, exactly. What that's thing are you pointing at? Exactly. I don't know. It feels like the engines have like a query like box or something. But in box 2D, which is like a 2D physics engine thing, um, it has like a query A, B, B, where you can have like a, a box. You can it tells you exactly what is in this box if it arises. Oh. Yeah, that is kind of a common thing. Usually that falls under collision checking. Like they'll have a kind of like a test function where you can like give it a position in some collision bounds, and then it'll return you either a single like Boolean or a list of things that are colliding with that check. Godot again does that kind of weird because it's actually like the, they have a test move one as well as a move and slide with a little Boolean flag at the end for is this like a test only and you don't actually want to move in the move function? It's a lot to get used to, but we're working on it. Okay, the actual thing. 
this is this is the potentially disastrous part of the presentation where I'm going to close the presentation and attempt to live code this in front of you. This is not going to go well. Yes. In which? In Unity. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah, that's a dedicated function in like Physics 2D. That's totally a thing you can do. I mean, yeah, it's literally true. But I wasn't sure if it was like something like dedicated in Unity. I don't know how that. I haven't used that much. If 2D is just 3D with an access removed, why hasn't Unreal bothered then? I honestly cannot answer that. I was in a problems. That's like zero. And unironically, I've done so many problems that way as well. So actually, 2D is just 3D, but C equals zero. Same thing with graphics. Technically, you can do 2D or 1D, so it's really just like the zero in the element C. Technically, same thing on real, you just don't use the access. <laughs> you have to do it all in your eye. And the cool thing about doing 2D and 3D is you can actually have 3D in the like You can make stuff like pop over stuff. Super easy. Now we're getting into CSS land. Z and Z index ten thousand. I absolutely must have my element display over everything else. This is of vital importance. Yeah, I, I used to do that a lot when I was in middle school. I would code from scratch, and I would have to separate something, put to the top layer, and then I was like, no, actually, I need to separate the top layer. And they've all been finding each other at all times. It was a bad experience. I've since learned. All right. So let me see if I can remember how I did this in a definitely not sleep deprived haze. Do we have enough battery to do this? Wow. <laughs> we'll see if it works. <laughs> Bottom half is always emptier. So starting off, I guess we can. How about we start off with just um, hit a button, shoot a thing out. So essentially, we will need the input. So just detect that input. This also has an input map set up for the actual project, but it's very basic. Just essentially WASD, a grapple, and then that's, there is no jump. There is no jumping in this one. I tried to get the jumping working, and it did not work. Ignore that. More of GDScript being like Python because it doesn't know what to do if you put an if statement and don't put anything after it. it doesn't know what to do. So, I did make a grapple hook prefab just in advance of this where it's essentially just Ask an end bracket. Yeah, but, or is it like a continue? Um, it's a it's a continue without doing anything. It's essentially a no op. You need it after an statement all the time. Uh, no. This actually the only reason I added that is because it takes a lot after Python, and there's no valid code after this indent. And it needs valid oh, code. So this is this is the dummy valid code that I had to put in there as a placeholder. We'll replace it later. But yeah, this little prefab I made is essentially just like you know, grapple hook, yay! And then it uh, for the script part, it just has a lifespan and a speed, and it moves along until it hits something. And then if it hits something, then it actually calls a function in that object. 
Normally I wouldn't do this with like the parent reference plus function call, but due to the event issue I mentioned previously, this is kind of the way I had to do it. Where when you create it, you essentially just call this in it and pass it that reference as well as the vector it's supposed to be looking in, because this is the way that if you just create the object and it's only facing one direction, it's going to shoot off in that one direction regardless of what way you're facing, and we don't want that. So you actually have to pass it the vector for what way we're looking so it can face itself that way and go in the correct direction. So as far as the actual implementation there, we actually need to get that. So. Can I spell any words? Yeah, ready is essentially your technically not a constructor. It it gets called after the node and all of its children have been initialized into the scene tree, which is the technical speak for, yeah, it's a constructor. You do all your one-time creation code in here and then process is the thing that gets called every step. Yeah. Usually in any game engine, you will have a function for when it starts existing and a function for every step, and you can count on those two. Yeah, Unity has, I think, yeah, it has update. I don't remember what the, I think it's start in Unity. I'm trying to remember what the words are in Game Maker, but it also has this. Yeah. I think the step one is literally just called step. Like game framework has I think it's like a universal. Like it seems pretty Instantiate. They, they actually changed that for Godot 4. I had to adjust that because I've been using 3.5 a lot recently. And in 3.5, it's instance, but now it's instantiate because they wanted to be different like that. That line really just, for some reason, you have to add the actual thing that you created as a child to something. So I'm adding it to the actual parent object so it's on the same level as the player rather than being a child so you don't get any movement weirdness. But essentially that's just um, like add it to the thing. Uh, and then because of the way that this actually collides with things, we're going to want to place it at a spawn position that is not inside the player because if we place it inside the player to begin with, it's just going to hit that and delete itself immediately and that's not what we want. We don't want to grapple onto ourselves, maybe. Normally I would do that, except for the fact that um, it's getting instantiated somewhere that didn't allow me to do that. It was weird. Oh no, I was just like noting that yeah, I actually had that problem with the Raycast part because it actually has a dedicated exclude parent checkbox here. Oh yeah, same, same. That is like exclude parent, but then you also have an array password. Oh, that would be nice because with just this checkbox, it checks this parent, oh, which is good. which is the rotating mount and not the thing that's actually the collision. <laughs> so I had to. That would that was awkward. 
Uh, yeah, that's an arbitrary number. I could probably go for 1.2 or something. That's that's completely arbitrary. I've seen a lot of people say not to have arbitrary numbers in your code, but whatever. We're going fast. Ish. This this is the start outside of the player. So the look vector is literally just the vector in the direction that we're looking, and it is just the direction because I made sure it's a unit vector. So whatever we multiply with it is preserved and not get any length weirdness. Vector math. Yeah. You want to take Calc 3? It actually teaches you vector math. Can you say I'm doing vector math in three dimensions? Well, but also it's classical. Well, it's it's gonna suck, but <laughs> oh, we don't. I I just took it for a semester for funsies, and regretted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, console majors only had to take up through count two. Yeah. Sure. Right, we also have to initialize this. Don't mess up my... Ins I increased the brightness so I can actually see what's going on. Got that initialize function we showed up before. Uh, it's not this, it's help. They had to come up with some other term. <laughs> right, so that should that should at least be the thing to fire off the things. We will see when when it runs. Why are you taking longer than normal to? Oh, okay, good. Yay. <laughs> yes, you're correct. We have not implemented that function yet. We're getting there, Godot. Trust the process. So, yeah, these are. Okay. At runtime. At runtime. Realize you'll never know the difference. Yeah, normally, normally in any other kind of language or framework, it would give you an error about that and not run the game if that function did not exist, because other languages are compiled languages. But because GDScript is heavily based on Python, I'm pretty sure it's an interpreted language. So it doesn't check that until runtime. All right, implementing these functions. So that's just. Um, our grapple hook likes to send its position, or at least the the position of that collision point that it gets to this function, which we are currently implementing, and it's empty. But essentially, once we have this position, we're going to need to store it, as you said. So, sure, we can make another variable for that. Oh, we have become the blender monkey. I have seen a person who tried to start like a CU Boulder primate club and it's literally just buying a whole bunch of bananas and standing around in a circle eating them, making primate noises. I don't know if anything ever came of that. Uh, that guy's great. And then once we have that, we're going to need to be able to tell ourselves, hey, once we have this position, the thing actually doesn't know to check for whether it has a valid position or not. 
for like, we, we just send these out into the ether and then we don't know what happens even though this function gets called. So how do we know what happens? How do we know that we've been like, we've hooked onto something? We could do a collision check every single time, given that we're creating this at some indeterminate point in time, how would we do that? This function here is called specifically when the grapple hook hits something. I'm pretty sure it has an event. I haven't been using them because okay. I'm terrible like that. Yeah, and we can do that instantly. This is the kind of more complicated projectile version where we send a thing out and we don't know what happened. And the way that I'm essentially, the way that I did it in this one is essentially just sets a Boolean flag for like, hey, we grappled onto something and now we can, like we're, we're attached to it and we're in that kind of grapple state. So we can pull ourselves toward a thing now. But we do need to have that like stored somewhere in order for the rest of the system to know. So I'm just gonna, I don't have that defined right now. It's gonna yell at me. See, it's yelling at me. I thought that was likes to complain about what it likes to complain about exactly when it likes to complain about it. We actually haven't finished writing all of our functions. We have another one here that gets called and it's, I apologize for having all of this written out in beforehand. I have the full version of it in another script and it's basically just, I duplicated that and deleted all the code in it. It was hard enough to debug when I had all the time in the world to debug it. Tutorial, like implement everything from scratch, like start the project from completely ground zero. It's like, we have the time. It's, we have one hour. We have one hour. We actually don't have an hour. We have 10 minutes. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying, if we have hypothetical disturbance, we have one hour. Actually, if you use the whole hour, we made a 3D array for every possible case of every possible target. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have a machine learning algorithm. We if we had that if we genuinely had that 3D rate, that would be like genuinely excellent time complexity, absolutely abysmal space complexity. I refuse. I categorically refuse to ever use chatbots for this. They're also terrible at more basic things like internal consistency. They are not designed to be internally consistent. Oh, no. like the least of Unreal, Now I'm not even remembering what I was doing. We have nine minutes left. Uh, we'll leave that for later. Uh, but yeah, now we have that little thing for we have grabbed onto a thing, and now we have some thing that we can run in the main process loop. Trying to remember what I did for this because we can just do the naive. Um, Kind of the naive move towards the thing approach that we can have like um, uh, 
get that direction and then get the um I don't have a grapple speed in here, do I? Dang it. More arbitrary numbers, but they're arbitrary numbers that are established beforehand, so it doesn't count. These are correctly arbitrary numbers. And then here, this is kind of the naive approach of we get the difference between the positions, and this returns a vector that points from us to the hook we get that the direction of that one by normalizing it and then we multiply it by speed and the time delta the time delta is nice because it actually stabilizes your movement across different frame rate changes that's the whole point of why anything does this you'll see it's called different things in other engines like time dot delta time in unity or whatever but this is a standard utility and then we can just do that and hopefully it'll pull us toward it, but we won't be able to detach yet because we haven't written that yet. <laughs> I'll definitely make sure to post like the full project afterwards so people can actually interrogate it, but now we can fire that out. And now we have no way down. <laughs> Oh, we can our first bug. Yay. Build off of Gmod infinite clipping. It's just just the gr I actually did do that and for like a for like a VR where essentially it was building for Google Cardboard and the only input you had was like one button. And a, and a look direction. So the only movement that you had was the grapple hook. That one was actually pretty nice. Yeah, we have five minutes left, and I don't think I'm going to be able to finish this in time. So let's actually go over the final code. There is no homework. In fact, that, that reminds me that I have some residual tips here that I should probably go over before the thing ends. So this was this was the primary ethos, which is kind of like the top-down approach for like just generally divide things up and they'll be more manageable. This second point is one that I really want to impart upon people is that you can just look up and find solutions in other games and the way that they solve one specific problem can be used to solve a completely different problem if you're clever enough about it. Because sometimes a lot of the problem definitions are very similar. That's how you get things like, how, how do you get complex menu animations based off of every single thing? Is that, well, if you, if you have an actual menu cursor that animates between things, you essentially have the cursor position, the position it wants to go to, and then some value representing the progress along that transition. And then once you have that progress number lurping between those two, or interpolating between those two, you can do basically anything with that interpolation number. You can have that be the frame of an animation of a thing in the background. You can have that be the rotation of the button so it spins around. You can have that be a Boolean check for whether to play a weird sound upon changing menu items. If you've ever seen the menus from Shadow of the Hedgehog, they literally have a gunshot sound. Every time you change menu items, it's hilarious and it fits the game's brand to a T. <laughs> also, comment scaffolding, which is not a thing that I did here, is essentially you go in and you put in the, the base logic as well as just like one comment representing a chunk of code that you're gonna write later. For like, just make this check and then just like comment for it does this thing here and then move on with your life, which is a nice way of getting through the overall logic structure without getting bogged down in the kind of minutia of actually implementing things. 
thing? Yes. Yeah. Um, cool thing about the uh, extension that every time you have an assignment and it says to do in it, it'll highlight it and it'll add it to like your list. I'm gonna need that because I I already use to do comments. Like really use because it's like it'll literally show you a whole like hierarchy of your file structure of like where each to do it is and, like a movie description. Yeah. That's actually amazing. I didn't know about that. Quick question about the comments thing. Yeah. That really just like a um, more sort of broken up style of doing pseudocode, where you're just like describing how something, what, like what the code is going to look like before you actually write it. It is essentially a form of pseudocode. I know I, I've seen a lot of people use the term pseudocode specifically for like you're just writing a, in, in like a text document. Or this is what this part is going to do without actually having it in an IDE that would evaluate that. So this is essentially a way of doing pseudocode in an IDE so it doesn't complain about you about this. This is not a word that exists in our directory. Please explain because it's all in comments. Yeah, that's a good question. But breaking that comment down over the parts where the code will actually. Yeah, and then you have actually like valid logic code that breaks those up. So then you, when you go in to replace those little comment snippets with the actual code, then the actual logic is already there. And you don't need to rearrange things as much. <laughs> All right. You, you, you're going to do uh, Knuth take the wheel? point is this kind of point that I'm making about uh, basics with slots built in. And essentially what that means is the idea I mentioned earlier of building a specific thing while also having an idea of like, okay, I need to communicate with these three other things and have like, if I need external resources that get loaded in or something, then essentially building in the slots for those to go in as you're building the basic structure of the thing rather than trying to go in and carve them in afterwards, if that makes sense. But this this also kind of gets into some juice things, like juice is essentially all the stuff that you do in order to make the game feel good. So you have all these like weird easings and stuff and movement curves and delays and whatever. Building those in, like in the initial structure can make it so much easier later on because you don't have to go in and break up your stuff and add those in afterwards. Because if you know you're going to use that later, then just build it in the first time. And going back to the mixing and matching problem solution, sometimes it's about rearranging the problem statement into a thing that's better to implement rather than actually trying to knuckle through a weird solution to something. This is, the, this is the thing that prompted it. Like there is no homework here. No one is making you do this. No one is making you be here. Thank you for being here anyway. Uh, and just generally tools exist to help you. If the tool is not helping you, it's generally the tools problem. There are some things where you, there's an acclimation period to the tool. I, I have every confidence that people can do great things in Unreal Engine if you take the time to learn it and adjust to its crap factor. But I am not one of those people. It does not work for me, and I am not going back to it if I can help it. Also, learn vector math. Even if it's not like full Calc 3 level, just knowing things like, like unit vectors, normal vectors, dot product, and cross product. Those four things I have used so much. Yeah, that's that's all you need. 
And just generally being familiar with vectors, because if you're doing anything in 3D game dev, it's all it's vectors all the way down. Like if we look at, yeah, if we look at the actual things here, it's basically just like, it's all vectors. We have a vector to the actual hook position. We have a vector for which way we're looking, as well as the actual angle between those two, which they have a nice little function for. As well as this is this is kind of a sneaky use of the alert function, but they actually have alert function on the vector three class, so you can interpolate between two vectors based off of a certain amount that you want from one to the other, which is no. The the way that this this actually relies upon the fact that when you have a vector represented. What those three values represent is up to you determining how the vector is used. Because sometimes vector threes are used for positions. So you have x, y, z coordinates. And sometimes, for in this case, we have um, vectors that solely represent direction or represent like a change in position. So those actually represent offsets rather than something. So like the actual vector itself represents like how far away from our base point are we going rather than the actual base point itself? Mm -hmm. And that's what both of these are doing. So you lurk between those. So you have one for what direction we're going towards the hook and what direction we're looking. If we interpolate between those, we get that nice mixture that we're looking for, for this kind of slingshotting behavior. I haven't shown it off. I should probably shown it off. Hmm? It does. I think, yeah, it has it has a curve resource that you can just plug into things and use for that interpolation. Yeah, and this one, I essentially used the the alert that I used. I'm essentially just using a standard value, which is just the ratio of how far towards the angle cutoff are we, as a function of like how far along towards our like look vector should we point our velocity which in the final version lets us do crap like this will it work will it work before my computer dies it's taking a long time to load for some reason so yeah that's the that's the us actually sticking to it. And then if we aim away, no. Let me do the heckin' thing. Yeah. Velocity slingshotting. Animal two. Animal three in the making. You know it. We are making the third Titanfall game so they don't have to. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's essentially what I have for all this. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm gonna stop the recording.